Tonight on NBC10 Boston, coronavirus concerns coming to the forefront. Breaking news tonight, the coronavirus deaths growing in the U.S. With nine people out in Washington state dying from this virus. The governor laying out to the details. The top priority continues to be the health and safety of our residents. The deadly disease spreading around the world with cases popping up throughout New England. And as the numbers rise. Wake up, get ready. We're going to the experts to get your questions answered. From local hospitals to schools down to the supplies in your home. We'll help you prepare for a potential outbreak tonight on Coronavirus Concerns. Good evening, everyone, and thanks so much for joining us for this special edition of NBC 10 Boston. I'm Phil Lipoff. And I'm Shannon Malaire. It is the topic that no one can escape right now, the coronavirus. It's this microscopic parasite, too small to see with the naked eye, that's sparking panic around the globe, but also conversation. And so tonight, we want to be part of that conversation with you by keeping you informed and answering some of the key questions. Okay, so first and foremost, what is the coronavirus? What are some of your biggest concerns? And what can you do right now in your own home to prepare for a possible pandemic? We also have an expert in studio tonight who's going to provide critical information surrounding this virus. We'll sit down with Dr. Paul Sachs from Brigham and Women's Hospital in just a minute. But first, let's get a look at the latest numbers. Cases are still climbing worldwide right now. More than 92,000 people have been infected. At least 3,200 have died from the virus. There are more than 130 cases here in the U.S., but more than 49,000 people have already recovered. And that is where we want to start tonight with a closer look at this respiratory virus and what was first discovered in China now being reported in 60 other countries including right here in the US. The World Health Organization has upgraded the global risk of the coronavirus outbreak to very high both in terms of spread and impact. While that is the top level of risk assessment, WHO officials say there is still a chance of containing the virus if action is taken quickly. While most of us are calling it the coronavirus, the World Health Organization's official name is COVID-19, which stands for Coronavirus Disease 2019. It was first reported in Wuhan, China back in December. Coronaviruses are zoonotic, meaning that they are transmitted between animals and people. And we know many of the patients first diagnosed with the illness had a link to a large seafood and a live animal market. But the CDC says we also know that COVID-19 can now be spread person to person. How? Well, just like the cold or the flu. An infected person sneezes or coughs and those little respiratory droplets travel as far as six feet. Those droplets can then end up in your mouth or your nose and be inhaled into your lungs. How contagious is it? Public health experts are not sure yet. It appears to be spreading easily and sustainably in the affected areas. But just how easily is it being investigated? Early data suggest it spreads easier than the normal flu, but not as easy as measles. We'll have to wait to see what more data shows. So what are the signs if you have COVID-19? Well, it's a respiratory illness, so symptoms include fever, cough, shortness of breath. The CDC says it takes 2 to 14 days after being exposed for those symptoms to develop. It's still unclear whether a person is contagious during the incubation period, but some evidence suggests that could be the case. Preliminary data also suggests that older adults and people with underlying health conditions or compromised immune systems might be at greater risk for severe illness from the virus. But again, still too early to know. The biggest takeaway? Don't panic. Wash your hands, stay home when you're sick, and take the advice of the World Health Organization's director. This is not a time for fear. This is a time for taking action now to prevent infections and save lives now. All right, now let's give you a bigger perspective on just how many countries are infected worldwide. Take a look. More than 60 countries have confirmed coronavirus cases. As mentioned, experts believe the virus started in China, but it's now spreading across the globe. We're seeing increases in cases in places like Italy, South Korea, and Japan. And take a look here in the U.S. At this particular moment, there are at least 132 cases across the country. In New England, there are now several cases popping up in New Hampshire, Rhode Island, and here in Massachusetts. And Phil Airlines parking planes and slashing flights in response to the coronavirus. Plus, the World Health Organization is advising anyone over the age of 60 or with underlying conditions to avoid crowded areas, and that includes airports. NBC 10's Eli Rosenberg live at Logan for us, and Eli, travel is really topping the list of concerns here. 
Yeah, you know, these are uncertain times here at Logan Airport. New tonight, several airlines, including United Airlines, slashing their schedules, both domestically and international. And this is something here. Earlier today, Governor Charlie Baker asked universities, colleges, and high schools to suspend their travel abroad programs. At an airport with direct connections to areas of the world hardest hit by the coronavirus, nothing being left to chance as travelers continue to wonder if they should catch their next flight. I'm not a threat, but serious. As the virus continues to evolve, Boston Logan Airport is evolving too. In a press conference this morning, Massport CEO who oversees Logan saying the airport has rigorous cleaning procedures in place and continues to educate passengers. This after several corona scares but no confirmed cases involving passengers on flights landing at Logan. I think that we are planning and preparing uh, as we have been uh, and um, I'm confident in those efforts. It's affecting the airline business. Meanwhile, in a meeting with top airline executives at the White House, President Trump insisting it remains safe to fly domestically. And this morning, Governor Charlie Baker taking a rare step and asking area colleges, universities, and high schools to suspend all study abroad programs. The chancellor of UMass Amherst reacting. This is a pretty big deal. It is a very big deal because uh, it has implications in terms of degree completion timetables for families and the cost associated with it. Dr. Lin Chen is director of travel medicine at Mount Auburn Hospital and has this advice for travelers. As we stand here right now, yes. what we know, would you get on a commercial flight? I would, but it probably depends on where. As a city pretty much a direct flight from anywhere balances the risks and rewards of being an international destination. Right now it's anxiety because there's, there's so much we don't know. And tonight, experts tell us really the name of the game is being informed and having fle flexible travel plans. But as you can imagine, that is leaving plenty up in the air for travelers. Live at Logan, Eli Rosenberg, NBC 10 Boston. Okay, Eli, thank you. And joining us now is Dr. Paul Sachs, Clinical Director in the Division of Infectious Diseases at Brigham and Women's Hospital. Good to have a doctor here. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for inviting me. All right, so SANS Tonight is all about answering your questions. We hit the streets to find out what are your concerns. And when it comes to the coronavirus, it turns out a lot of people have the same questions. How deadly is the virus and how widespread is it gonna, is it gonna be? What's the, what's the likelihood of us dying from it? Am I gonna die? All right, so you're kind of chuckling, but everybody wants to know if they're going to die, doctor. Is that a realistic threat here? Well, the, if there is any good news about this virus is that it turns out that most of the cases are mild. We now estimate that at least 80% of the diagnosed cases are mild, don't require hospitalization. There are even some people who, who get the infection and don't have any symptoms at all. Uh, so that's the good news. Uh, obviously, there is a concern. I don't want to say that it's, I don't want to minimize it, but I do want people to understand that just because this virus is out there and perhaps circulating in our community, they, they should be okay. So a lot of people trying to figure out how to prevent it. And there was originally, when we started talking about this, a run on masks. Uh, talk to us yeah. about masks, how effective are they and who are they effective for? Sure, I mean, I think I want to, I want to say something about masks in the hospital and in the healthcare setting and masks in public. Mm -hmm. In the hospital, there are, you will see doctors and nurses wearing masks when they're caring for people who have infectious diseases. They put them on specially for that purpose and then they take them off. Wearing masks in public, there really is no evidence that does actually prevent getting infection. And one concern people have is that putting on a mask actually puts your hands on your face more often, and that is actually one of the ways that the virus spreads. All right, let's uh, take another question from one of our viewers. Can you get it from food, like foodborne? Decent question. Yeah, so, so the way that this virus is spread is from two major routes. One is a person with the infection is coughing or sneezing and you're close enough to actually get the virus right mm. from them that way. Lovely. Yeah, uh, <laughs> that, that is certainly a major route of spread. The other is that we know that people, like other cold viruses, this virus can go on surfaces. And so by being on surfaces, if you touch those surfaces and then touch your mouth, your nose, your eyes, you can get the virus that way. Those are the two main routes of transmission. So far, we don't think that food is playing a role at all. 
All right, Dr. Paul Sachs joining us. I know he'll be back with us in our next yeah. box, so hang tight. Thank you for your answers. Uh, state leaders, meanwhile, hoping for the best while trying to contain the spread of the coronavirus. But behind the scenes, they're furiously preparing for the worst. Absolutely. Ryan Kath takes a closer look at what's happening to make sure we're ready if there is an outbreak. Right now, how confident are you in Massachusetts' ability to be prepared for this? I think there are a lot of very smart people who are working this. State leaders are trying to stay one step ahead of a pandemic threat, where information changes by the hour. We will be disinfecting every vehicle every day. The T's general manager said workers will ramp up cleaning efforts, wiping down the spots riders touch the most every four hours. You'll also start to notice public awareness messages during your commute. Public health is nearly invisible when it works well. But it's in the spotlight now, and Massachusetts has a unique situation. Local health departments are responsible for monitoring patients who quarantine at home. But of the 100 smallest communities, we learned about three quarters don't even have a full-time employee, and more than half have no health inspector. How big of a challenge is something like this? It's a pretty significant challenge. It's a really significant amount of work when something like coronavirus is threatening the public. If there was a surge in cases here, do we have the needed amount of beds and facilities? We are preparing for what may come. We get a glimpse of what that may look like in this document from 2006, the state's plan for a flu pandemic obtained by the NBC10 Boston investigators. That plan predicted an outbreak of a new virus could quickly overwhelm the state's acute care hospitals and require patients to be treated at other sites like armories and school gyms. It was very stressful because you want to be as accurate as you can. Former Public Health Commissioner Cheryl Bartlett recalling the Ebola virus scare in 2014. The best barrier to an infectious disease is our skin. When anxiety levels are high, she says the toughest part is the delicate balance between keeping the public informed and creating panic. Do you want to feel like you're in control and managing the situation that is hard to control and to manage. The state did get some positive news from the CDC. It was clear to do coronavirus testing here at its own lab. That will speed up the process and allow health officials to react quickly if the disease continues to spread. Ryan Kath, NBC 10 Boston. Ryan, thank you. And as the city and the state prepare for the virus, what about schools? NBC 10 investigator Ali Donnelly finds out what's being done to protect your kids. Plus, hospitals working round the clock. What to expect if you have to be put into isolation? And I'm going to tell you what you may want to stock up on at home just in case. That's coming up after the break. Welcome back to our special edition of NBC 10 Boston tonight. Yeah, coronavirus concerns. The odds of you getting the virus and requiring hospitalization is low. That is the good news. But local hospitals are still ready with isolation plans. NBC 10's Christy Lee takes us to Mass General to show exactly where and how a coronavirus patient would be cared for at MGH. We ask patients and visitors... Eileen Searle's job is to make sure the staff at Mass General Hospital is trained and ready to handle infectious disease emergencies. So we have our special pathogens unit, which is where we are today. This is where a patient with coronavirus or COVID-19 would be placed in isolation and get supportive care. So these are private rooms that have a different air handling system. So the air in them is vented and filtered out of the facility. There are 10 of these negative yeah. pressure rooms, but what if more were needed? We do actually have some surge planning where we could take an entire floor of one of our buildings and make that entire unit negative pressure. But Eileen says the need to do that is probably unlikely with coronavirus. The vast majority, 80 plus percent of cases are mild illness very similar to the common cold. Um, and so most people, even if they have COVID-19, can be safely managed at home. For the small group of people that become more seriously ill, we provide ventilatory support, oxygen as needed. And that means taking every precaution not to spread the disease. So Hannah is going to show us uh, how to don the personal protective equipment that we use for patients. So tell me about this gown. Is there something special to it? 
Yeah, so this gown is a fluid impervious gown. It protects Hannah's clothes as well as her arms. After the gown, she's reaching for the mask there. Is this a special mask, right? Yeah, so this is an N95 respirator, and this really filters out uh, particulate in the air, including virus particles. Once fully protected, Hannah can safely enter. What happens when she comes out of the patient's room? Yeah, so what she'll do is when she's done delivering care, she'll step into the ante room and she'll be able to remove all of that personal protective equipment there, wash her hands and come out. While the staff says it is prepared for coronavirus, you can help keep these rooms empty by wiping down surfaces and washing your hands often. But the key with anything is if you're sick to stay home. Christy Lee, NBC10 Boston. Uh, Christy, thank you. And also tonight, we're getting an inside look at a secret warehouse actually owned by MGH preparing for a possible pandemic. This is an NBC News exclusive. This warehouse is in a secret location and it holds a stockpile of emergency supplies. The boxes you see here all filled with equipment like gloves, gowns, masks and other things needed in a critical situation. And while it may look full, doctors say the supplies you're seeing on your screen will only last about two weeks, if you can believe it. Meantime, from Europe, the Middle East to Asia, countries are now taking new measures to control the virus. Right now, the Italian government is closing schools and universities all across the country. Here at home, federal officials warn the potential for widespread school closures, which means parents and educators need to figure out some sort of backup plan. Investigative reporter Ali Donnelly looks at one public school system to see how they're working to prevent disease and also to keep the kids learning. It will be really bad, really, really bad. Picking up his son in Worcester, Andre Cedillo says he can't imagine the disruption if schools shut down because of coronavirus. How are we going to work? How are we going to pay our bills? Too much to think about now that I'm, I start to get worried. <laughs> Worcester Public Schools Superintendent Maureen Bignetta hopes it never comes to that. But she's paying attention as a staffer at a Rhode Island school was diagnosed with the illness and students in Bellingham and Newton were told to stay home all after trips to Italy. We are in constant communication with public health. So uh, we would call them and um, ask for what their advice is on that. Last week, an official with the CDC warned of closures and urged parents to ask their child's school about plans for tele or online education. Are you prepared to tele-educate? Could you? So we could not tele-educate. We don't have the capacity for that. There are so many of our homes that don't have any Wi-Fi. Uh, they don't have internet. Regardless, she says, like many urban schools, they don't have enough computers to send home. Older kids could study textbooks or work on papers, and younger kids would be encouraged to read or do take-home packets. The most important thing is that kids still are learning. At a press conference with state officials this morning, Governor Charlie Baker urged schools to cancel any international trips. Taking this precaution will help protect both the students and the Commonwealth. Bignetta says Worcester schools are focused on prevention, as they are with flu and other viruses, encouraging kids to wash their hands, cough into <laughs> elbows. Staff are keeping soap stocked in bathrooms and spot cleaning classrooms, while school nurses are tracking illness and absences. In the past, we're always saying it's really important to come to school every single day, right? And now we are saying that if you don't feel well, stay home. The Department of Ed sent a letter to superintendents yesterday reminding them that the risk is low in Massachusetts and urging calm and common sense prevention. Allie Donnelly, NBC10 Boston. Allie, thank you. And with a growing number of coronavirus cases, many are wondering what they can do. The biggest piece of advice is to not panic. If you are worried that you have the virus, call your doctor. That way they can take extra precautions to help stop the spread of the illness if you do have it, whether it is coronavirus or potentially the flu. Something experts suggest not to do is stockpile face masks. Surgical masks are for people with symptoms and healthcare professionals. The CDC says regular surgical masks are not even effective in protecting against the coronavirus. You heard Dr. Sachs say that at the beginning of the show. In fact, they can put you at greater risk because you tend to fiddle with them and touch your face a lot, which is something you definitely no, no. don't want to do. Yeah. All right, but with all that being said, there are ways to prepare if the coronavirus spreads in your community. NBC 10's Leslie Gatiss has a list of the things you should have in your home if you're forced to stay put. 
If you or someone else in your family is exposed to the virus and you have to ride it out at home for a while, it will help to be prepared. You'll have one less thing to worry about and you can avoid store lines where you may be at risk for infection. Chances are you already have a lot of the things you will need for an extended stay at home, but now's a good time to take inventory and stock up. You want to have enough food in your house to get through a couple of weeks, so fill your pantry with canned and non-perishable foods, soups, crackers, cereals. And if you have freezer space, you may as well fill that up with essentials that you may need just in case. Meats, frozen vegetables, bagels, bread. If you have a baby, you'll need a two-week supply of baby formula, food, and diapers. And don't forget pet food and pet supplies. Make sure you have medicines on hand for yourself and your children. Pain relievers, cough and cold medicines, vitamins, liquids that have electrolytes, and tissues. Anything you may need if you aren't feeling well. If possible, get a two-week supply of your prescription medications. You may need to ask your doctor for help if your prescription has a quantity limit. If someone in your family comes down with the virus, you'll want to avoid sharing personal household items like dishes and drinking glasses. So having some paper plates and paper cups on hand may be helpful, even some bottled water. You'll also need to repeatedly clean all high-touch surfaces in your house to prevent the spread of the disease counters, tabletops, doorknobs, bathroom fixtures, and toilets. So make sure you have a good stock of cleaning supplies and laundry detergent. And don't forget soap, because frequent hand washing is a must. And another thing to think about, if you're caring for others like elderly parents, have a backup plan in place, just in case you get sick. Leslie Gatiss, NBC10 Boston. Leslie, thank you. Washing hands, obviously important. I saw someone from the CDC said you wash like this. You know, you got to get in there. And sing happy birthday. And right. sing it twice. Yeah. <laughs> twice. <laughs> All right, <laughs> Leslie, thanks. So here, here are some of the things that we know. We know it's deadly. We know it is contagious. But we also know there are ways to combat it. All right, so Dr. Sachs from Brigham and Women's Hospital joining us again. So we talk about Purell being important, washing your hands. Are mm -hmm. those your best advice right now for preventing this? Sure, hand sanitizer is important, but I do, don't want to underestimate soap and water. Soap and water, very old fashioned, but viruses hate soap. You know, viruses get really destroyed by soap. So I would strongly recommend that people do that old low-tech thing as well as go to Purell. That's always good advice. Yeah. Uh, also, is the happy birthday thing a valid thing? Like, you can't just wash for three seconds and move yeah, on. Yeah, three seconds won't do it, but okay. about, you know, 30 seconds or so. It's not, you don't have to do it for five minutes. It's not okay. like a surgical scrub. Just really get in there, though, and not... Yeah. Okay. Uh, one thing that everybody's talking about right now is testing. Yeah. Uh, people are seeing it come to their communities, come around their communities. So if I were to feel feverish and I had a cough and I went to my doctor, how would they test me for so, it? So your doctor would do an assessment of whether your symptoms are consistent with coronavirus, and if uh, they think they are, then they would then do some additional questions about whether you've been to any of the places that have cases. But one thing that's recently changed is that we're now allowed to test based on our own judgment. Mm -hmm. And so there's going to be much more increased testing in the weeks going forward. We're a bit behind other countries in the United States in getting the tests out there, but that is starting to change. So th more testing is definitely going to happen. All right, so a question too is, should you talk to your family about an emergency plan? Is it that serious at this point or is that something that not necessarily needs to be done I right th now? I think there were some common sense things that people can do. I, I know it was mentioned about having some extra supply of your prescription medications on hand, but I hear about people, for example, storing water. And, and right now there's really no evidence at all, even in countries that have been hardest hit by coronavirus that there's been any effect on the water supply. I also want to have people to think back not too long ago. I don't know if you remember, but in 2009, there was a pandemic flu outbreak. Right, and, right. you know, suddenly there was flu in the springtime and a lot of people were out sick. I think it may be a lot like that, uh, even at its worst. So, so it, it could potentially be very disruptive, but we'll get through it. All right, Dr. Sack, thank you. You're welcome. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. All right, the most important piece of advice, wash your hands. Average person doesn't do it long enough, and you might not even be doing it right. Christy Lee has a refresher. Washing your hands seems like a no-brainer thing we learned to do as a little kid, but still, so many of us do it wrong. So let me show you what the CDC says is the correct way. Wet your hands, apply the soap, and start your mental timer. You need to lather and scrub your hands for at least 20 seconds. That includes the back of your hands, between your fingers, and under your nails. 
20 seconds, by the way, is how long it takes to sing the happy birthday song to yourself twice or sing the entire ABC song. But don't worry, I'm not going to sing because... Saved by the bell. That was 20 seconds. If you're not Thanks so much for joining us on this special half hour of NBC 10 Boston. We hope we answered some of your questions and eased some concerns that you've had about the coronavirus. I'm Shannon Malair. And I'm Phil Lipoff. We'll see you back here tonight at 11 for NBC 10 Boston Tonight. Have a good night.